In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want us to put ourselves a little more deeply into the story in the book of Acts of St. Paul and his visit to Athens. This story in Acts is about mission. That, I think, is kind of obvious. But it's also about what we might call pastoral care. There is a divine model for pastoral care that's in here, or a divine basis, perhaps, um, for, for, for caring for one another. By pastoral care, I don't mean just your priest doing you know, visitation. I'm, I'm talking about all the things that we do for each other as we care for one another, and indeed as we care for all those around us in, in, in mission. Now, first century Athens was very much like 21st century Pittsburgh. Um, it was a university town. The arts flourished. They were heavily into their sports. And Paul is on a kind of a layover there. He had been in Thessalonica and had a rather interesting experience there, a violent one at that, and so it pretty much run out of town. He goes on and finds a better reception in Berea, at least for a while. But then he leaves Timothy and other members of his traveling party on this missionary journey there while he moves on towards Corinth. And it is in Athens that he waits for the rest of the team to catch up with him. But while he's waiting around, he doesn't want to waste his time. So Paul does what he does in any city when he arrives for the first time. He first goes to the synagogue, gets into conversations with the Jews and those who are known as God-fearers. These would be Gentiles who had not fully converted to Judaism. That is, they had not gone through circumcision and the baptisms, but they nevertheless worshipped the God of Israel and believed the scriptures of Israel. So Paul goes into the synagogue and he meets the Jews of that community and the God-fearers and has conversation with them. But eventually he starts looking around town and he gets involved with uh, some of the other groups that were in this highly um, cosmopolitan center of the ancient world, Athens. Eventually finds himself on the Acropolis and gets into conversation with a bunch of the uh, philosopher, uh, philosophers up there. And, you know, I, I think one of the reasons he would start in the synagogues when he'd go into a city was simply he had more in common with the people there, with the Jews and the god fearers in the synagogues. But, you know, even, even here on the Acropolis, um, you know, with, with, with the philosophers of Athens, he looks for cultural common ground. Not a bad policy. And he finds cultural common ground. He makes reference to their sculpture and their architecture, their monuments, references to their philosophers, to their poets. And he tells them about one of the monuments he had seen around town. He mentions, oh yeah, by the way, I saw that, I saw that uh, monument to the unknown God or that altar to the unknown God. And he kind of riffs off of that. You know, many today worship an unknown God. So often, I will encounter people who say, well, actually, I'm not even religious. Um, they won't say they're atheists. They won't say they're agnostic. They're just nothing. But you know, you cannot be nothing. Nobody is nothing. So, this unknown God that I encounter very often in my urban context here in uh, the 21st century, um, I don't think it's a problem of faith. I think it's a problem of naming. I guess, you know, as I tell my students so often, you know, the person who writes the dictionary is always going to win the argument. But I mean, you know, it, I guess it depends on what you think religion is. I really do like Paul Tillich's definition of religion, that that is a person's ultimate concern. That's your religion. 
Because most of us, you know, pressed into a corner, we find ourselves in some sort of a panicky situation, most of us, under pressure, have some sort of a default that we fall back on, some sort of a set of values that are the drivers in our lives, the, the thing that we fall back on, that we depend on, that is the foundation for everything we do and say, sometimes even eat. So I think most people have some sort of an ultimate value that they fall back on, and that is their religion. I mean, sometimes your God may be yourself, it may be money, it may be pleasure, but one way or the other, everybody does have a God, whether they have named that God or not. They have a religion, whether they have given it a name or not. Um, and once one does name his or her religion, name his or her God, who or what is in the driver's seat of their daily existence, in other words, um, then they can face with greater integrity the question of whether or not this is satisfactory, right? Whether uh, this particular faith of theirs is sufficient or not. And when you actually look at it under the microscope, when you shine the spotlight on it, when you name it, it gives you a better, you know, you, you, you have to deal with it. You have to face it and say, okay, well, is this really what I want to be known for? Is it? And Paul's message to the Athenians started where they were with their religion, but he aimed to advance their spirituality into something that was more personal. He, not, not just something they would argue about and you know, be intrigued by and the, at the Areopagus. Not just something to impress each other with or to fascinate. There, there's an interesting phrase in this story in the book of Acts, actually. If you just go back a few verses before our reading began, where he, he kind of disses the Athenians. You know, they, they, they love nothing more than to just sit around and talk about it. And he was trying to move them from talking about it and fascination and intellectual involvement into something that had more to do with something and someone known and something which could actually transform their lives and give them purpose. So his message has both head and heart appeal. It contains all sorts of elements. I mean, if you want to just approach it intellectually. Uh, Paul's uh, speech, at least what we have of it, you know, it's, it's not a probably a full um, transcription of his speech up there, but it's a good condensation of it, I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, but what we have, it, it, it does show that Paul had a real knowledge of, of classical rhetorical strategies and categories. You can, you can look at it for its ethos and its logos and its pathos and all these other wonderful things. But he does have appeals to authority. You can see that in our little speech there in Acts. Appeals to logic. Appeals, oh, you know, calls to action. I mean, he, he, he tells them, um, you know, he, he wants them to change their minds and to change their lives. He says, repent. That's, that, you know, when he comes down to the end of his little speech, he actually says, look, you know, we've acted in our ignorance for a long time, but now, you know, especially in the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's shown us what God is like, and you know, it's time for us to grow up, worship the one true God, the creator God, and uh, repent. That's not just saying, I'm sorry, it's turning, changing your life. And that's what he calls them to. And he has appeals to their deepest desires. It's not just an intellectual appeal. It's an emotional appeal, too. You know, people crave love, and intimacy. It's one of the areas we most mess up on. But Paul's good news to the Athenians was that he, that is God, is not far from each one of us. That's a huge message. He is not far from each one of us. Not far. He's intimate, he's close. From each, this makes it personal. Yeah, it's corporate too. He's close to us by the Holy Spirit. He comes to us you know, collectively as a church, but also to each of us individually as, as believers in Jesus Christ. So this God who had been resurrected from the dead, as we 
understand both from Paul's teaching and from Peter's teachings from today's scriptures. This Jesus who was raised from the dead um, is also this, this, this God who we know through Jesus is the one who is close to each one of us. And it's, it's exactly what Jesus was talking about in our gospel today, right? What does he say? I'm not going to leave you orphaned, right? And how is it that you're not going to be left orphaned? It's because he is going to send you this. He calls, in, in, in our gospel, he calls him the advocate. But uh, this, is, this is your companion along the way. It is the Holy Spirit that Jesus promises. And indeed, who comes in great power at Pentecost to his church and to his, and it comes to each of us at baptism. So it's by that Holy Spirit that is one of the ways that he is always close to us. It's, it's how he effects that whole web of love that Jesus is talking about in the Gospel of John where, you know, I am in the Father and the Father is in me and I'm in you and you're in me and if you're in me and you're in the it, it's, it's this whole Father, Son, His people, His disciples, then and now you and me and all of this facilitated by the Holy Spirit. No, we are not orphaned. He is indeed close to each one of us. And our various feelings about God will come and go. Um, there are times when you will be ecstatic and you will just know, maybe you're in corporate worship, and you will just know so deeply. It might be singing Vaughn Williams like we did for our sequence hymn. I'll tell you, that does it for me. Singing the words of George Herbert to the music of Vaughn Williams. You know, it may bring you to a point of ecstasy and knowing that God is not only really, really possible, but actually really, really close. It's wonderful. But there are other times, other circumstances where you may not feel that God is all that close at all. Sometimes the presence of God brings you miraculous relief and healing and remission. It may be over time, it may be an instantaneous sort of miracle. There are other times, for reasons which can only be known later, that God doesn't meet our needs the way we ask, um, or doesn't meet them on our timetable. Marvelous quote which Leslie Thyberg shared with me this week. It's from a, um, it's a researcher at the University of Houston. She's a sociologist named Brene Brown. She's written some pretty popular books, and her, her talks, her, her TED talks, if you want to look them up on uh, either the TED website or on YouTube, are uh, among the most, I mean, she's got like half a million kids. She's amazing. But Brene Brown, after going through a crisis, after a breakdown, um, returned to the church after a long time away. And she said it was for all the wrong reasons, at least at first. She said, I, I thought that faith would say, I'll take away the pain and the discomfort. I thought faith would say, I'll take away the pain and discomfort. But... What it ended up saying was, I'll sit with you in it. But in any case, the fact, not, not how we feel about it, the fact is that he is not far from us. This is what St. Paul tells the Athenians. This is what the Bible tells you and me. This is what Jesus promised in our gospel today. He is not far from each one of us. That is either a true or a false statement. However you are feeling right now, whatever your circumstances are right now, that is the assurance of Scripture that we have about the presence of God in our lives. He is not far from each one of us. You know what? Being present is perhaps the greatest gift that we, too, can give to another person. It's also probably one of the areas I feel the most challenged, personally. I love being with people. I love being with you all. Um, but not just my church people, my students, everybody. Um, I love being with you. I, I'm not sure people always know that. I, I, you know, I'm a gregarious, um, extroverted, you know, whatever. But I think people often do get the feeling that I'm very, very busy. I think you all get that impression. Um, the impression comes from the fact that I'm probably very, very busy. But <laughs> excuse me, but this is urban America in the 21st century. Is there anybody here who is not very, very busy? Two people. <laughs> Praise God. It's a gift. It's a gift. Make the most of it. 
But uh, you know, a lot of us are busy. But are we too busy for one another? Are we busy for the people that God puts into our orbit? And we're talking about a prayerful presence. This is something that extroverts and introverts can do. Just being with somebody. Doesn't have to be expensive. <laughs> to be with a person is, it is pastoral. It is priestly. And you are the baptismal priesthood which those of us who are ordained are here just to serve. If any of you need the shoe shine, I have my maniple here. It's kind of like a waiter in a restaurant, right? But no, you have pastoral callings as brothers and sisters in Christ, in what we call the body of Christ in the church. You have priestly duties where just by your presence you are mediating the presence of God, the love and oftentimes the mercy and the grace of God. You are mediating all the goodnesses of God in the lives of other people. That's a priestly thing. It's also evangelistic. Just being there is evangelistic. I, 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 there's a marvelous story in the um, Hebrew scriptures. In the book of Job, all right? So Job is this guy who's very well off. And then all sorts of calamities happen to him at once. And some of you have experienced this. It seems like when one thing happens, a half dozen things happen. One person dies, and it just seems like a whole bunch of people die. One person gets sick. You get sick, and everybody in your family gets sick. One little financial challenge comes to you, and then suddenly a whole bunch of financial things happen at once, right? They just kind of all happen at once. And poor Job, it just all happened at once. And he had a group of friends, three or four friends. This is so beautiful. They came to Job, and they just, he, he was outside. This is the Mediterranean, you know, so you could do it. The weather was okay. Job is there trying to scrape all these scales on the skin. He has some sort of a skin disease now too. And they come and they just sit with him. And they sat with him for something like seven or eight days, not saying a word. You worried about what to say? You know, if you go visit somebody in the hospital, <coughs> try the Job model. Just go and sit with somebody and don't say anything. Make sure you make them comfortable with that. But, uh, they just sat there for days. And actually, when they get in trouble, it's when they open their mouths finally. You know? So you've got, I don't know, 30 odd chapters, almost 40 chapters in the book, where you have all these arguments. And, uh, you know, their, their presence was imperfect, if that's any comfort to you. Uh, their presence with Job was an imperfect presence. But, you know, they were there for his struggle. They were there for his struggle, and he kind of struggled with them. They struggled, too. Um, I, I, I had the marvelous opportunity to spend time with Daniel and Tina at the hospital when Tina had her surgery on Thursday. So uh, we all arrived about 5.30, and uh, I was able to spend a little bit of time with Tina. But most of the time I spent with Daniel and with his, uh, Daniel's mother, who uh, has been up here, too, to help around the house. And, um, you know, we spent some time talking about serious stuff, and a lot of the time we just sat there, waiting for news, being quiet, and um, Daniel was trying to focus on some reading he had to do and some for, for papers. Um, and I, I worked on the church bulletin. But you know, we were just there, until Tina came out of surgery four and a half hours later. Um, was that hard to do? Well, you know, I had to get up and get out of bed, but you know, the point is, you shouldn't have to walk through that kind of thing alone. And uh, that's what we're there for. I think of our prayerful presence here in the script as well. Um, you know, Marion has a great burden for this especially. And uh, Marion and Christiana are taking it upon themselves to kind of help coordinate uh, 
a modest ministry whereby when we have people coming up on our script district cycle of prayer, we'll actually let them know ahead of time and uh, leave a little card with them, leave some literature, just so they know that they and the whole script district are under prayer, that they're covered. These aren't difficult things to do. They don't cost a lot of money. But these are ministries of presence. They are pastoral. They are priestly. They are healing. They reach out. They're evangelistic. You know, often someone knows that God is not far from each of us because of someone else who came close to them in his name. 